CRN webinar on implementing health assessments in primary care, a how-to guide. I would like to briefly review the agenda for this webinar. First, I will explain how to submit a question to our presenters. Then I will introduce today's presenters, Douglas Fernald and Richard Ricciardi. Mr. Fernald and Dr. Ricciardi will then give their presentation. There will be time for question and answer sessions at a few key points in the presentation and at the end of the presentation. At the end of the webinar, I will explain how to obtain CME credit for participation in this webinar. Please note that after today's webinar, a copy of the presentation slides will be emailed to all webinar registrants. If at any point during this webinar you have trouble hearing our presenters, please try hanging up the call and dialing back into the webinar. I will now explain how to submit a question to today's presenters. To submit a question, you may use the GoToWebinar control panel. Type a question under the Questions section and hit Send as shown in the screenshot on this slide. You may submit a question at any time throughout the presentation. During the Q&A sessions, as time allows, your questions will be read aloud and our presenters will respond. I am now pleased to introduce today's presenters. Douglas Fernald is a senior instructor with the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He is the director of Bighorn, a practice-based research network in Colorado. Since joining the Department of Family Medicine in 1996, he has worked extensively on large and small-scale evaluation and research projects in high-priority areas of practice improvement, including patient safety, laboratory testing processes, health information exchange, health assessment, and patient-centered medical home transformation. Richard Vicciardi is a, is a health scientist in the Center for Primary Care, Prevention, and Clinical Partnerships at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and a pediatric and family nurse practitioner. Before joining ARC in 2010, Dr. Ricciardi served on active duty for 30 years and had numerous positions with the Department of Defense, working as a nurse practitioner, senior leader, and clinical scientist. His research interests include disease prevention and health promotion, human performance and fitness, and the delivery and organization of primary health care. And I will now turn the presentation over to Doug Fernald. All right, thank you. Yeah, Can everyone Doug, see the slides? Get started? There we go. All right. Go ahead, Rick. Thanks, Doug, and thanks, Kristen, for that uh, uh, wonderful introduction and uh, the opportunity to be part of this exciting webinar. Um, good afternoon or good morning to all of you on the call. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day uh, to, to listen in and to learn more about uh, all the work that the team from the University of Colorado and, and those of us at ARC have put into this project, which we hope will um, make your workflow and your implementation of health assessments uh, easier, smoother, uh, whether you're a novice at it or whether you're an expert. Um, on behalf of our director, or actually our new director, uh, Dr. Rick Kronick uh, and ARC, I, I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, to this webinar. It's been a, a true pleasure for me to serve as a science officer and, and government lead for this exciting project. I, I've had the, the wonderful opportunity to see this project and to write it up from the start and then to see it awarded to such a distinguished team and group of scientists and healthcare professionals uh, from the University of Colorado. Doug, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, particularly, I would, I, I would like to uh, uh, note the great work and uh, thank Doug for his great work as leading this project. Uh, but more than that, the entire team. Uh, as you can see on the screen, the team, uh, the complement of the team is an uh, interprofessional group with both health services uh, research experience, clinical trial experience, practice experience, public health experience, and of a variety of, uh, of scientific backgrounds that came into this project that enriched it, strengthened it, 
and provided us with a network that we could reach out to other professionals across the landscape to inform this project, to, to strengthen it, and hopefully to make it easier on you all to uh, implement health assessments. Uh, particularly also would like to uh, recognize uh, a senior health services researcher, Dr. David West, for his uh, oversight and always wise uh, discussions as, as this project moved forward. Um, I will also serve as the moderator for this webinar, so when we get to the point where we have questions, I will direct the questions uh, to either Doug or uh, myself and keep the questions moving. One thing you should know is if we run out of time and we have a lot of questions, we'll be sure that we get the answers into your hands through Kristen uh, and making sure that you know we, we close all the loops on that. Doug, you can go ahead and move to the next one. Before we move into the uh, what you all came for, for the meat and potatoes of, of this webinar, I thought it would be helpful for, uh, for all of you to get a perspective, um, since many of you have worked with ARC or have used our tools, have, are familiar with where, what our mission is, on our new focus. So our new mission is to produce evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, more accessible, equitable and affordable, and to work with HHS and other partners to make sure that the evidence is understood and used. Now, this is significantly different from our old mission, which was to change healthcare. We are now producing evidence to team up and partner with others to facilitate changes, particularly enacting the Affordable Care Act and health services delivery. ARC also, uh, you can go to the next slide, Doug, has um, four, four priorities. Priority number one is to improve health care quality by accelerating implementation of patient-centered outcomes research. The Affordable Care Act created a national initiative to harness the potential of patient-centered outcomes research. And as part of this effort, ARC is charged with investing in developing the patient-centered outcome research methods, training patient-centered outcome researchers, and disseminating patient-centered outcome findings. The second priority is to make healthcare safer, which the components of this are to prevent healthcare-associated infections, accelerate patient safety improvements in hospitals and in ambulatory settings, reduce harm associated with obstetrical care, improve safety, and reduce medical liability, which we're taking a, a big role on and accelerate patient safety improvements in nursing homes. Priority three is to increase accessibility by evaluating Affordable Care Act coverage expansions. And from this project, we fall uh, in, in this priority where, where the, under the Affordable Care Act, it's directed to have an annual wellness visit uh, for Medicare recipients. And in this health assessment, we hope that in that uh, annual wellness visit and the opportunity to look at a health a risk appraisal or a health assessment, when you implement that, that this guide will be uh, much helpful in facilitating that. So this particular guide falls under the priority three. And our last priority is to improve health care affordability, efficiency, and cost transparency. And ARC will all develop and spread evidence and tools to measure and enhance the efficiency of health systems, the capacity to produce better quality and outcomes while avoiding overutilization, and to maintain quality and outcomes with lower resource use. So at, that, at this point, that's the overview from ARC, how this particular project fits into uh, our mission and how it came to be. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Doug, who's going to drive us through the rest of the presentation. Uh, thanks, Dr. Ricciardi. I'm going to start and say I have no financial to dis disclosures or no financial relationships to disclose, and I will not talk about any um, off-label uh, drugs. But I do want to start here and say uh, thank you to ARC and Dr. Ricciardi and all the staff there who have helped uh, put this health assessment how-to guide together 
and I also want to welcome everybody. Good morning and good afternoon. I want to set the tone before I get going here with a quote that we had from a patient advisory group and one of the uh, patients in this group really had a, a really insightful message about health assessments. We spent some time talking with the High Plains Research Network's Community Advisory Council about health assessments, what they are, what their potential is, and how they could be used to help uh, patients improve their health. And at the end of the day, this is one of the quotes that we really felt captured a lot of the patient perspective around really using health assessments effectively. And we tried to weave that into our um, conversations here. And when we developed the guide, try to keep that in mind. And really, the, the message was relationship first and health assessments. And the point being that for health assessments to work really well for the patient, it works best when there's a relationship with a provider who can understand something about the patient beyond just the check boxes and numbers on a health assessment questionnaire and really help to guide the patients in making good choices and uh, improving their health. So I want to set the tone there. Um, the objectives for the day uh, are really to describe a little background on health assessments for primary care and really define what we mean by health assessments. Talk a little bit about our practice observations for how to effectively implement health assessments and describe the work we did in our primary care research network practices. And then uh, talk about what patients said about what their priorities are for health assessments. And then we'll spend some time just going through quickly some of the main sections of the how-to guide, which is available on ARCH's website if you don't already have that. Um, as uh, Dr. Richardi said at the top of this, that we will stop at a few points and um, invite questions, just uh, a few minutes to answer any clarifying questions at a, a couple of points in this presentation. And then, of course, we'll leave time at the end for uh, really any questions you might have about our how-to guide or any other aspect of the project. Uh, first, a little bit of background on, on what we mean by health assessments. Uh, you've probably all seen a questionnaire like this. If, you're, if you work in a, a primary care practice or if you've been a patient, you've probably answered a questionnaire like this that asks a bunch of questions about um, health behaviors, health risks, uh, good things you're doing for your health, uh, things that might impact your health around uh, social support, whatever it is. And I want to emphasize that a health assessment is really more than just what the questions are on a piece of paper or a set of questions you might complete on a, a tablet or something like that. Um, when we talked to our patient advisor groups here in Colorado, uh, they talked about um, what it meant to them and what they would like to see or hear about as patients um, a description of a health assessment. And here's what they came up with. This is the Colorado Research Network Patient Advisory Council. They said a health assessment is a set of questions answered by patients that asks about personal behaviors, risks, life-changing events, health goals and priorities, and overall health. And then they went on to list uh, a number of uh, types of health assessment questions you might be asked, and included everything from familiar things like uh, tobacco use, uh, physical activity, or diet, uh, but also included things like um, uh, safety, uh, sexual activity, uh, things like that. So they had a pretty clear understanding what health assessments were. But I want to also go a little bit farther and um, develop what we learned as a, a more complete definition of health assessments and that health assessments really are a process to collect information from patients and then use that information to engage them in a conversation about their health and then really work on how to lead a patient to better health choices, better care, and improving health behaviors for the long term. And so again, the, the, the point here we're trying to make is that it's a, it's a systematic process it's not just answers to questions on a piece of paper. Something have to, actually has to happen with that information and has to be a conversation with patients that's informed and directed towards you know, really identifying and supporting beneficial health behaviors to improve a patient's health. Um, and I also want to make the distinction that uh, this goes a little bit beyond than a simple uh, screening tool or health histories or uh, sometimes in uh, primary care practices we talked to, they were thinking about these review of systems forms that asks about you know, all the diagnoses a patient has had and surgeries and allergies and uh, things like that. While those are important, it's not really what we're talking about 
in terms of health assessments. This is more of a, a systematic, comprehensive effort to collect and use information from patients to improve their health. And one other thing I want to emphasize is that uh, when we went out to practices and talked about health assessments and to patients as well, uh, we learned that uh, there was an expectation that we would show up with a single health assessment survey. And such a thing doesn't really exist. There are many different ways to um, ask questions about a patient's health, their health risk, their health behaviors, and um, uh, there isn't a single health assessment out there. Uh, but there are many, and mostly they, they cover a lot of the same territory. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, why we would even consider doing routine health assessments in, in primary care. And, and part of this is what we learned from the literature and talking with our expert panel, but also what we learned in uh, talking with primary care providers, their staff, administrators, uh, uh, you know, medical staff, nurses, everybody who works in our primary care setting. And they were pretty clear that one of the main aims is to really improve care and improve patients' overall health and well-being. That, that's the goal. It's not, again, just about um, getting answers to questions to uh, fulfill um, uh, some certification requirement. Uh, the other thing we heard is that it really enables practices when you do routine health assessments to systematically collect high priority information from patients to improve their care. So again, uh, it's not uh, just collecting a random set of questions. These are important questions, uh, information you want to know about uh, particular patients. Um, one of the things that we heard from both patients and uh, providers is that health assessments are an opportunity to hear what a patient's priorities are. And that can help uh, really refine options for what the next steps are going to be in designing a care plan or planning uh, something you want to help a patient um, do to improve their health. Um, we also learned that um, health assessments done well can activate and inform patients about their own health. And it shows that um, you're interested in, in learning more than uh, just what they're doing around their diabetes care. You care a lot about um, different aspects of their health. And finally, uh, there are some incentives out there. And, and the most um, obvious one that we're going to come back to um, a few times is the new annual wellness visit for Medicare beneficiaries that um, was rolled out as part of the Affordable Care Act from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And just uh, to point out a few incentives that um, we know of, obviously there's the Medical Annual Wellness Visit, which is a, um, an incentive for uh, Medicare beneficiaries to have an annual health risk assessment done. That's what the uh, language of the guidelines says, and it really is a, a routine systematic health assessment. There are also aspects of um, health assessments in the uh, meaningful use criteria for demonstrating uh, meaningful use of electronic health records. Uh, there are aspects of health assessments in uh, patient-centered medical home recognition. And we've also heard about um, health systems that, as part of the profit sharing incentives, uh, practices are expected to do routine health assessments. Um, the other incentive, which we heard really motivates the practices we talked with and the providers and staff in those uh, practices that doing the health assessments routinely is helping to address clinical priorities or questions you might have about um, a certain set of patients. That was really driving a lot of the initial interest in uh, how practices decide which health assessments they might select. And then repeatedly we heard from both uh, our patient advisory groups and from uh, providers and staff we talked to that really health assessments help you have a better conversation with your patients, which is really um, really the aim of what patients are looking for that you'll hear a little bit more about. Uh, just do want to point out that there are some barriers that I'm sure many of you are uh, familiar with if you're trying to do any kind of um, practice change or practice improvement activity. Uh, there's uh, always a lack of time to introduce something new into a practice. Uh, there's often uh, a lack of resources for appropriate follow-up with patients. So once you've done a health assessment screening, how do you ensure that you have all the resources, training, skills, knowledge, materials to do uh, whatever follow-up is needed based on what you learn in a health assessment? Um, this uh, lack of knowledge and training came up, uh, and this 
I'll just cartoon this with an example. Uh, one practice we went to, they wanted to learn more about patients, their adult patients who might have um, ADHD, and they were concerned about it because they just didn't feel like they knew enough about the instrumentation of screening for it and what the scores meant, and then what would be the uh, most evidence-based effective follow-up to do. Um, so there's that uh, knowledge and training that uh, might be lacking. But also on the part of patients, not all patients really understand how health assessment information and data are used either in a conversation with a patient or in other ways as a informing a, say a patient registry in a practice to look at uh, your practice population. Uh, and finally, we heard that some of the uh, financial incentives are, are insufficient to support really full, comprehensive, routine uh, health assessments. Um, but at the end of the day, when we talk to practices, the, the, the big incentive here, I think, is that uh, health assessments give uh, practitioners and staff better information about their patients so they can really have a more informed conversation. And, and this quote came from a, a practice manager in one of our uh, research network practices. And she said, you know, don't be afraid of the information you're going to start seeing from health assessments. You'll have better insight and probably learn more about your patients, thus building a far better relationship with your patient than you may have thought possible. And that's pretty much what the patient said too. So there's there's good agreement there on on one of the benefits of uh, of doing routine health assessments. Uh, I'm going to take a a little break here and uh, let the audience ask us questions if they have any clarifying questions or observations they want us to comment on about uh, what we're talking about in terms of health assessments for primary care. Doug, while they're writing, I, I will comment uh, an earlier question that came up. Uh, someone mentioned that they didn't notice that there were any nurses on the University of Colorado team. Um, I will speak first and then give Doug the opportunity. Um, as you all know that I'm a nurse, I'm a nurse practitioner, and I, I can assure you that I had uh, uh, a perspective uh, that added to um, the project itself from uh, the nurse practitioner role. And I also feel very strongly at ARC that we include the physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, and, and other disciplines that are engaging in, in the whole concept of health assessments. And Doug, you, you may want to make a comment on uh, some of the practices that you reached out to and uh, the, uh, the nurses that you engaged with. Yeah. Uh, and others, and, and other disciplines. Yeah, so when we went out to, um, we worked with a set of 14 primary care practices and it was a whole range of practices from a large residency practice to small solo uh, nurse practitioner run practices in, in rural eastern Colorado. And when we worked with the practices, we went out and we talked to and observed everybody in the practice. So in every role, front desk, uh, nurses, the um, clinicians in the office, and um, so we were really talking with everybody, uh, the whole team, when we talk to practices about health assessments. And we also had um, a, a nurse practitioner on our uh, expert panel that helped guide us and advise us on um, their perspective in health assessments. And we also had a, uh, a nurse who was uh, on the expert panel and addressing really a uh, heavy focus on uh, pediatric populations too. Thanks, Doug. We, um, uh, we have another question that you may uh, be addressing later. So, uh, but one question is: Do you, do you provide the patient with a summary report of what their assessment shows? Um, I can answer that now, and we will get into that a little bit in the implementation. But it's a great question, and uh, there there were different models in practices for how to do that and when to do that. And we we certainly hear from patients that they they really want to report back. They want to know what the doctor or nurse practitioner or a care manager or care coordinator is thinking, uh, what their interpretation is of the information they just supplied on when they're answering these questions. So yes, patients do want feedback. How that actually gets done really depends on the um, capacity, workflows, uh, technical skills, and um, uh, clinical training of who is actually reviewing responses to a health assessment. 
Great. Thanks, Doug. Um, next question is, uh, it, it says, regarding the lack of resources for appropriate follow-up with patients, how would you feel about electronic assessments in assisting with uh, health assessment? Uh, so, so the use of health, uh, either electronic health records or electronic-based health assessments and facilitating uh, for practices perhaps that don't have resources to do it in person. Yeah, I think the what we heard from uh, again from practices and from the literature is that the the technology is not quite there. There are some um, tools that you can uh, purchase that will do uh, an inventory and assessment and then provide uh, direct feedback to patients and give them uh, uh, tools to kind of walk through the prioritization process and those can work and they can be evidence-based, but I think the, the key here is that the follow-up really should um, follow the evidence, evidence for um, what is the appropriate follow-up, but also uh, insert and include a conversation with a patient that really relies on the clinical judgment of uh, to providers who, who really know something about the patient and all the things that, that might be going on with them. Thanks, Doug. And, um there's a question that asks, do we have resources for tools or examples of health assessments? Again, I think you're going to touch that later, but... Yes, I'll, I'll hit on that later, but um, the appendices in the how-to guide um, offer a set of questions that uh, we know work in primary care practices and have a, an evidence base behind them, um, but you also see links to specific population resources, so different age groups for uh, different places you can go for uh, more detailed health assessment questions. Someone asked, Doug, uh, in terms of when you mentioned uh, routine delivery of, of health assessments, the question is a good one. It's how do you define routine? Or in other words, what is the interval, uh, the best interval, or the best practices of an interval for, for delivering a health assessment? That's a great question. And I'll, I'll tell you right away that the science on the interval for doing these is incomplete. We know that you have to do it at least once and then at least yearly is, is probably the, the best we can offer right now for a comprehensive health assessment. We heard differing opinions uh, from the people we talked with about what the appropriate uh, timing is. Some practices we talked to, they do them at um, every preventive care visit or a wellness visit, which often happens annually. Of course, the annual wellness visit for uh, Medicare beneficiaries is uh, once a year. And then um, there are some practices we talk to that actually have a, a routine assessment they perform at every patient visit. They call it a patient agenda, and it asks a set of health assessment questions and um, asks what their priorities are. So differing, and um, I would say, you know, at least once a year. Thanks, Doug. There's another question that asks, can, we, can a clinical pharmacist be involved in, in, in conducting health assessments uh, regarding their potential scope of practice? I can address that a little bit if you want. But, Great. Why don't you take that one? Um, I, I believe from the perspective of the delivery of the health assessment, uh, it, it depends on the team and, and how the workflow and how the team determines how they want the, the uh, health assessment to be implemented. For example, if, if, if on your team you have a clinical pharmacist and that person is engaged in health promotion and understands some of the concepts, uh, they may be part of reviewing the responses from the patient, particularly if it's a patient that's elderly and has multiple chronic conditions. So, I think a lot of it depends on the population you're serving and uh, what your expectations are coming out of the health assessment to uh, improve behavior. Remembering that fundamentally the ultimate goal of, of conducting health assessments is to improve health, to improve the patient's health or move them toward optimizing their physical and mental health in, the, in a better state. So depending on how you get there, you might be required to use uh, different members of the team. Um, oh, I think we have time for one more, Doug. Uh, but again, those of you who have submitted will um, will continue on when we have our next break for questions. Um, let me see. Uh,
I think, let's see. Um, I think we can move on, Doug. I'll get to some of these other questions. There seem to be a bunch of overlap. Okay. So great. I'll sort through some of those if you want to go ahead and, and resume. All right. The next section here, I want to talk a little bit about and highlight some of the main things we learned from our work in the field with uh, providers and their staff, administrators, in the um, practices we that were in our project. Um, I want to first just remind us what we were doing with this contract with ARC and basically the first part of this project was to identify best practices for implementing health assessment in primary care, primary care settings. And um, we um, used a number of different methods for that. Then we had to develop a how-to guide, and then we worked with another set of practices to field test the guide and then revise the guide based on what we learned from that. And then we um, had to make sure the guide is available for anyone who wants to use it, which is now housed on the ARC website. Um, I want to also emphasize that this was a, a multi-partner effort. We had representatives from the American Academy of Family Physician National Research Network participate. We had practices from uh, Louisiana, Georgia, and New Jersey and, and, and the, from that network. We also had three networks here in Colorado participate, CareNet, the High Plains Research Network, and Bighorn. And these are all um, primary care practice research networks and include both internal medicine, uh, family medicine, pediatric practices. And then I also want to point out what I think are one of the most important things and most important partners in this were the CareNet Patient Advisory Council and the High Plains Community Advisory Council. And basically these are our standing uh, committees that advise and guide the um, practice-based research networks in uh, developing research studies. Uh, coming up with new ideas, interpreting um, uh, results and findings, and helping to really disseminate back out to community members uh, things we learned from our uh, practice-based research network effort. So multidisciplinary effort. And I'm just going to highlight now just a, a few of the, the key messages that uh, helped us think about how to organize the content of the how-to guide. Uh, first of all, the, the main things we learned from practices is that um, implementing a new health assessment is best done as a team effort involving everyone in the practice. And I, for those of you who are um, working on practice transformation about patient-centered medical home or tried to uh, um, achieve meaningful use standards for electronic health records, um, this is not going to be unfamiliar. It's, it's probably going to sound familiar that uh, this is a team, a team sport to implement health assessments. We also learned that uh, an important feature of any new health assessment is that it really needs to align with what practice priorities are for patient care. Um, and there are lots of things in a practice that um, dictate what is a priority and a higher priority versus a lower priority, um, but they seem to work best when implementing health assessments if they align with one of those practice priorities for patient care. Another important thing we learned from uh, the practices is that um, health assessments are really tools to create a dialogue and inform the conversation between a patient and his or her provider. And I've already said that, but I'm just going to emphasize again, this is what we heard from the practices. And um, we had some uh, beautiful examples of how um, providers can engage the patient in the conversation after they've completed a health assessment. And I'll share a couple of those with you a little bit later. And then um, it was pretty clear that um, as we um, observed how the process went in practices, that um, patients really need a little bit more information from providers and the staff in practice about what health assessments are, how the information was reviewed, and then how private providers and practices actually use the information. I think uh, most of the patients we spoke with were a little bit skeptical that the information just goes into a black hole like all the other um, pieces of paper they have to um, fill out in their lives. And so uh, um, our practices were pretty clear that they tried to work at you know, telling patients how they were going to use the information. Um, we also learned that practices wanted help with um, a few 
key things in implementing health assessments. And one of them somebody already asked about uh, was, you know, help me find the questions that are suitable for primary care settings. What are, what is that set of questions I should be asking and which are the right questions to be asking? And although there isn't a single set of questions that I deal, uh, they're starting to become a, a narrowing set of, of what I would consider kind of a, a starter set of health assessment questions that are fairly comprehensive. Um, we also heard that this annual wellness visit from uh, Medicare uh, takes a little bit of reorientation of patients and practices were looking for advice and guidance on what to tell patients about um, this new um, annual wellness visit which really talks strictly about the health assessment versus what they might be used to in terms of an annual physical exam. So they wanted help with that. Um, and again, the third bullet for anybody who's worked on uh, meaningful use or quality improvement activities or registries, um, they're really looking for help integrating health assessments with information systems, particularly uh, electronic health records. And then lastly, uh, practices were pretty clear that they would like ideas, thoughts, techniques, uh, tools for engaging patients in prioritizing the care options um, so they're having a more efficient conversation with patients and coming to agreement about what's possible for helping engage patients in, in changing or improving their health. So I want to now just share a few things that uh, we learned from patients and community members that we talked with on our two advisory councils. And I have to say this is one of the most uh, gratifying portions of the project because we spent a couple of days with these advisory councils and really talked at length about what health assessments are, uh, how they could potentially be used, and what patients really expect from them. And as I said at the top of this, you know, it's, it's really all about the relationship first and health assessments. And they went on, uh, the patients and community members went on to say that, you know, health assessments really work more effectively when they're in, done in the context of an established relationship with their providers. Um, and um, the second bullet here, if, if you walk away with nothing else, this might be one of the most important bullets, is that uh, patients expect some acknowledgement that a health assessment questions have actually been reviewed and the response is considered. They want to know that this information isn't just being set into a pile somewhere. They want to know somebody's taking action on it, even if it's a very brief acknowledgement. That's what they're really looking for. Um, and the third bullet here, it fits right in with what we've been talking about and what um, we heard from practices is that health assessments should inform the conversation with their provider. So there's, there's agreement there. And then finally, in this last bullet, there's also agreement. Patients want to be asked about their own health priorities as part of their health assessment. So, you can ask me all you want about all these other health risks, behaviors, whatever, but give me a place that I can actually say what I'm interested in and what I think is my biggest concern for the day. And we know there's some uh, tools and techniques out there that can actually use this information to build a more efficient uh, office visit. Um, I just want to pause there and see if anybody has any questions about what we learned from uh, the work we did in observing practices and um, from the lit review and talking with our patient advisory groups. Okay, Doug, the first question, uh, we'll take at least another 10 minutes here, is from uh, someone asking, do you think that SBIRT should be included in this approach? Um, yeah, so I can answer this one, Doug, because okay. I'm familiar with the SBIRT. That's typically an approach that's used in the uh, mental health world or behavioral health world and I believe some of the questions that are taking out of that assessment might be directly incorporated in a health assessment but health assessments are, are comprehensive across the medical landscape looking at function and, and cognitive status and, and uh, uh, health related behaviors so part of that is mental and behavioral health so some of those questions are included in the health assessment. Doug, I don't know if you want to respond on any of the behavioral health questions in the health assessment or? Uh, yeah, basically I, I would have the same response that the the expert uh, questions certainly fit in to um, what could be a more comprehensive health assessment and a, a lot of it's going to depend too on uh, you know what the um, clinical priorities are for a particular practice. If they're really 
want to uh, get into more um, health behavior, health behavior change, um, and, and mental health side of things, then it may be perfectly appropriate to include the SBIRT as one of your health assessment tools. Um, here, the next is a question that we've discussed. Uh, it's a good one, uh, and uh, she's asking if you could talk about the advantages and drawbacks of having clinic staff ask patients health assessment questions versus patients filling them out themselves. In addition, in your experience, what is the feasibility of having patients fill out these health assessments on a patient portal prior to the visit? And are any, are any to your knowledge, are any primary care clinics in the country doing the uh, portal or the uh, entry to the health assessment through an electronic portal? Okay, I'm gonna, I'll take the portal question first here and then I'll work back to the other one. Um, we didn't, in our work, in, encounter any examples where patients were going into uh, an electronic medical record portal to answer health assessment questions, but I will tell you this, that um, our patient, one of our patient advisory councils asked for that very feature. They told us, you know, we're already on the portal checking our lab test results and, uh, you know, checking appointments. Why can't I just answer my health assessment questions right there? I could spend more time on it and I, I could really answer them more completely. So it, it's, it's out there and I know we have some practices locally that are uh, thinking about turning on that feature, but they're not quite there yet. Um, and then to the other question about whether it's better to ask patients directly the questions or let them answer it um, by themselves on, say, a paper questionnaire or even through a portal. Um, we have ex examples of both that worked, and I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the comfort level and training that um, uh, team members have within a, a clinic and kind of what they're doing. And the other aspect of it is how do we want this to fit into our workflow? And we also have examples of practices that um, use a kiosk uh, type approach where they fill out uh, patients fill out a health assessment questionnaire there, and then it, the next step is to um, the person at the front desk reviews it or an MA reviews it and sort of summarizes for the um, provider's uh, next possible action steps. But we really saw it all, and I think it has to do a lot with training and the workflow in an office and the, and the technical capabilities of an electronic system. Great. Thanks, Doug. I am aware that uh, Dr. Alex Christ out of uh, uh, in Richmond in the Commonwealth of Virginia is doing a fair amount of work looking at portals and having some of the patients in that particular healthcare system uh, generate uh, a portal entry. I, I think it's experimental at this point and it hasn't been fully incorporated into the electronic health record, but that's where he wants it to go. So uh, that's a, a great idea and a good point. We, we um, we got a comment from someone who said uh, they're in agreement with this and also uh, excited about the fact that the Affordable Care Act is giving us the opportunity to get engaged and in, uh, in, in get more involved with health assessments. And I guess uh, I would say that Doug and I both agree with that and we appreciate that uh, response. Um, let's see, I'll move down the list here. One question about, did you find uh, in clinical practice that there was disparities between the questions and recommendations from the U U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and uh, the common questions that are used uh, to generate answers on the health assessment form? Or are they generally in alignment? Um, so they're generally in alignment, and the, the thing about the um, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendation is they often don't specify which particular questions you should ask. Um, just to uh, use uh, depression screening as an example, uh, the depression screening questions that we found in most health assessments are most people are using the PHQ-2 or the PHQ-9, which really aligns nicely with the um, recommendations from the Preventive Services Task Force. Um, I will say, though, that the in, you know, the key here is that the recommendation is that you'd only do the screening if, if you have the appropriate resources available for follow-up. And I think that's the, the message we're here loud and clear for all of these questions is um, the questions are, are only half of it. The rest of it is really how you follow up 
for those questions, including maybe a more in-depth uh, screening or evaluation tool. Thanks, Doug. The, the next uh, is a good question uh, where someone is asking, uh, will you describe use of aggregate data compiled from health assessments, for example, identifying frequent patient concerns, risk stratis and you know stratification or risk modeling of patient population. So essentially the use of the health assessment data to inform your population. Is that something that you've encountered or, or uh, would recommend is basically the question. Yeah, and that's and part of what's in the, the later sections of the guide is this idea of thinking about your patient population or uh, a population health in, say, a community. And uh, we did hear from practices that, um, especially for patients with uh, chronic illnesses, that the health assessments actually help their care managers understand where they can get some traction in terms of having a good conversation with patients and how they can engage them in identifying one or two things a patient can work on to, you know, help manage a chronic condition like diabetes. So yeah, there's absolutely potential and good potential for using health assessment questions at both a, a practice level and understanding um, dimensions of your patients on different um, health assessment parameters and also at a, at a population level if you're working within a, a larger system or in a community. The next question is uh, someone who is, is uh, validating what we're saying about the value of, of health assessments, however, is somewhat concerned about incentivizing their use. For example, are there strategies to assist clinicians in seeing the value of, the, of implementing a health assessment? Um, so I'll, 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 there are two ways to think about this. One is just the, the straight ahead financial incentives. One practice we work with, um, what made this a priority for them was they had a relatively large Medicare population and this was low hanging fruit for them. They had to implement some kind of comprehensive routine health assessment to um, access those um, dollars that were made available to through their Medicare beneficiaries. So they wanted to do that. The other uh, way to think about it is that when we talk to practices, every clinician we talk to, every manager we talk to, even folks at the front desk, they all have lots of questions. They want to know more about their patients. And so the value is, and the incentive is, um, how can I do this? How can I help uh, construct health assessments in a way that gives me clinical information that I need to take care of my patients? And that was the bigger incentive. Um, for why practices do this or think about doing this initially. Um, it really is driven by a clinical need. And, and thinking more broadly, um, I'll, I'll use the ADHD example again. It was one practice we talked to, they were, the reason they were adding um, adult ADHD to their um, screening, uh, routine screening was they wanted to get a picture of, well, how, what's the prevalence in our practice today? I have no idea, and if it's really high, then I need to get more training and understand more about this. So uh, there, there are both clinical incentives to improve the care of patients and there are some financial incentives. And, and understanding this, that there are barriers and, and challenges in, in, in changing practices, that this particular guide provides valuable uh, tools that can assess the practice to see the readiness and what are some of the gaps and then perhaps work on where the areas that the, the commissions may not see value to facilitate and narrow some of those gaps and then so there's a lot of tools in this guide that can help move uh, the the health assessment implementation forward. Um, someone's asking um, what are the cardinal constructs covered within a health assessment? So what are the fundamental or underpinnings that are part of the health assessment in terms of conceptual areas. Uh, if I understand what um, is being asked about cardinal constructs, um, they're going to be include a lot of familiar health risks and beneficial health behaviors. So it includes, um, I would say, um, the um, guidelines from CMS on the annual health risk assessment is a pretty good list, but includes things 
like alcohol use, anxiety, cognitive impairment, depression, uh, physical activity and diet, um, overall health and well-being or quality of life, um, safety, that's a big one, social support or isolation, um, stress, substance abuse, alcohol use, and tobacco use. And those, I guess that's my, my short list of the cardinal constructs. Um, there is a list in the, in the how-to guide in Appendix 8 that uh, I think lists most of the common ones that we heard about. And you know, that's, a, that's something that we struggle with because it depends on the population that you're serving. Obviously, if you're a pediatric practice, your uh, health assessment will engage both parents or caretakers as well as the patients, and they'll have to have a developmental perspective to it. If you have an adolescent practice, it'll be different, and then you're dealing with young adults. The risks, health risks associated with young adults are different than the health risks associated with you know, a Medicare population. So it's a great question. It's one we struggled with, and we hope that the guide will provide ample evidence across the lifespan to to provide some constructs or some validated questions to facilitate implementation in the practice that you're serving. So that's a good, very good question. Um, could you differentiate between, we'll take a couple more questions, between health assessment and health risk assessment? The annual wellness visit requires the latter. So the difference between health assessment and health risk assessment or health risk appraisal. Uh, I'll take a crack at that, but uh, in my mind, uh, health assessment is a little broader because you might also be assessing uh, beneficial behaviors, not just risks. So uh, you want to encourage things patients doing well versus just identifying risk. Um, otherwise, I think as the previous question asked, there, the cardinal constructs are basically the same. Um, I think the um, health assessment is just a little broader in how we think about um, getting beyond just identifying risk, but also identifying beneficial behaviors to encourage in patients. All right, thanks, Doug. Uh, I think we'll stop here on the questions. Again, we have another. We'll have more time at the end of of the uh, session to uh, answer the rest of the questions. So I'm going to turn it back to you, Doug. Okay, great. In this last section, I I basically just want to walk through how we put the guide together, what informed it, and then spend just a little bit of time on each section of the guide and just highlight what's in that section and then at the end we'll, we'll take any uh, questions about the how-to guide itself or any other questions um, that we didn't get to that uh, about health assessments. So when we assembled the how-to guide, um, as I said, we um, did some in-practice observations in um, a set of primary care practices, all different sizes and types, and um, really took a close look and evaluated how practices were successfully implementing primary care practices or, or health assessments. And we looked at practices that um, use both electronic uh, data collection tools and uh, paper-based tools. Um, and then we uh, developed the guide and actually took it back out to eight more practices and did a field test of the guide and, and basically said, here's a guide on how to implement health assessments. Um, go forth and do whatever you choose to do. We didn't give them a lot of guidance on which particular questions to ask or what to focus on. We really wanted them to uh, work their way through the guide on their own and, and let us learn and observe. Uh, we also spent time on some in-depth interview with uh, providers and staff about what the challenges are around implementing health assessments effectively. Um, we did a review of the literature looking specifically for best practices and also looking at um, implementation uh, using um, electronic systems, which the data were, were sparse on best practices, and that um, uh, article just came out in the Journal of Ambulatory Care Management, so that's out there. Um, and then we also had our patient advisory groups uh, weigh in and um, expert panelists weigh in and really guide us in asking and probing in certain areas of health assessment implementation. And then we did a, a final critical review of the how-to guides content and the recommendations in there. I just want to say a little bit about who this guide is intended for and, and why we uh, thought about it this way. 
it really is intended for any primary care practice that wants to implement any health assessment. Um, if it's aimed at seniors, adults, children, or adolescents, it doesn't really matter. Um, the guide is really aimed at walking through the steps and helping a practice think about uh, what might be involved in selecting and implementing and evaluating over time uh, how they would implement a health assessment. It's designed to be used by uh, providers and staff who really want to improve the conversation with their patients. So whatever information is going to help do that and a process that's going to help do that, um, this uh, guide aims to inform that. It's designed for clinical leaders, managerial leaders, quality improvement organizations, anybody who wants a, a little more uh, guidance or a set of reminders about what to think about when implementing health assessments. And part of uh, how we designed the content um, was really to optimize this for use in a practice team. And, and Dr. Ricciardi mentioned this, and we heard from practices about how to do this well. And, and we know that uh, it really re requires a team to implement this and think about the implementation. It doesn't all have to fall on the shoulders of a provider to ask and uh, review assessments or figure out how to do all the implementation. It, it works best in teams, and so that's how we um, design the guide. And then also um, some tools in here to help patients engage in that conversation about whatever information is on the health assessment and how that fits in with uh, what the providers know are the important things to address for the patient. So that's that's kind of how we oriented the sections and the content of the sections. Uh, so basically what's in the guide is step-by-step -step guidance. We've broken into um, six what we call decision points for implementation. Uh, it includes practical lessons that we learned from others who have done this. Uh, there are some tools and checklists throughout the guide and then the appendices there are, are more tools including health assessment questions and links to other resources such as um, uh, coding for preventive care um, that might be related to health assessments. Um, and then uh, a lot of additional resources around uh, practice improvement processes for working on the, the workflow and things like that. Um, as I said, this guide is really organized into six uh, decision points. Uh, this is one of the uh, a piece of feedback we got from one of our expert panelists who said, you know, when I think about this, I think of, you know, these are the questions I want to be asking myself as a provider, but also the, the people I work with in my practice. And so that's how we organize it into these decision points. So the first one is uh, around practice readiness, just a, a quick inventory of how ready a practice might be ready to uh, embark on implementing a health assessment of any kind. Um, second section talks about uh, planning tools and um, reviewing priorities for uh, selecting which assessment you want to implement. Uh, section three is, is the longer section. It's all about um, implementing this and integrating this into workflows. Uh, section four talks about how to use the information. So again, it's not just about collecting the data. It also has to be put to use. And then five, uh, section five we thought was important about um, including patients or involving patients in this conversation and how to do that in a way that engages and uh, activates patients to, to take action. And then uh, a little bit about sustaining health assessments and, and really that requires um, some evaluation over time about is it still meeting your needs? Is there a little bit of revenue coming in from this? Uh, what are all the things you might want to think about to sustain a health assessment over time? So if you have the, the guide in front of you or opened up online somewhere, I'm just going to take a quick snapshot of each of the sections and, again, leave it open for questions after this. Um, section one, as I said, is this readiness assessment. And it's just a quick um, checklist just to get you thinking about the whole process from, from top to bottom. Um, and one of the ways um, we heard a, a practice think about this is um, the provider told us that, you know, I do a lot of quality improvement work and how this guide helped me is just reminded me of the things I need to think about um, before I embark on any practice change, including implementing new health assessment. And so this checklist is just designed to just walk through um, some things to think about and then where in the guide you might find guidance or uh, tools to, to help answer the questions. Uh, the next uh, section is about choosing an assessment. 
And again, we, we ask a few more questions here about, you know, is there a particular population you want to focus on that uh, is a priority for you right now in your practice? Um, and some other questions. And then we provide a crosswalk. And this is really designed to help you think about things you might already be doing and ways you might already be collecting some health assessment information. Um, and so you're aligning uh, health assessment with other um, improvement programs or reporting you have to do uh, for other um, recognition or uh, incentives. Um, section three is, uh, again, the biggest section about how do you get this into your office workflow. So you've, you've figured out what you want to do. It's a priority for the practice. How do you get that health assessment into the workflow? And again, um, I just want to emphasize that it's, it's a team effort. We know that works well. All the burden doesn't have to fall on physicians or nurse practitioners or any provider in the practice. There are lots of ways to think about using a team. And we saw lots of examples of uh, how a, a team member can review and, and um, sort of uh, prep the information and hand it to a provider. Or they can enter the data into an electronic system that then prompts the provider later. So lots of ways to think about using your team. Um, and this is also a little bit, uh, we offer a number of different sets of questions really to think about some of the implementation details. Who's actually going to identify which patients get this? How will that be done? Where's the information going to go? Is it going to stay on a paper form and be handed off to a provider uh, or a care manager? Or does it need to go into uh, an electronic uh, record, health record or other data system? So we just set up a lot of questions just as reminders to think about for uh, really getting the implementation and integration down. Uh, section four really hits on the question of, you know, now that we have this information from our patients, what are we going to do with it? And it mostly emphasizes um, uh, really meeting patient expectations and talking to patients about how the information is going to be used. And um, I'll just share with you a, a great example we heard from in, in one practice we were working with, and their method for uh, engaging patients and acknowledging to patients that this was important is they decided they needed to screen as part of their meeting their incentive uh, program requirement. They needed to have a, a certain set of questions that every patient with diabetes was asked. So they had to implement that. And their strategy was to have the MA hand a paper form to the uh, patient when they checked in, and then instructed the patient to hand that piece of paper to the provider when the provider walked in. And then when the uh, medical assistant was done and the provider came into the exam room, the provider would either ask for the piece of paper or the patient would offer it. And right then and there, the provider would do a quick scan and look for two things. One was uh, encouraging things like, um, oh, I see you're doing great on your physical activity this month, keep it up, and then one thing to tie into uh, a chronic condition or a, a worry the patient had about, say, heart disease or um, diabetes. And so it was an instantaneous transaction there, but it really in, um, enforced the message to the patient that, yeah, this is important. Not only is the MA looking at this, but also my provider, my doctor is looking at this. And that, that seemed to work very well. And so just a just an example there of how that might work in a practice. Um, and that fits in with Section 5, which is really how you um, engage or activate patients to use the information. Um, and again, it's all about reinforcing with the patient that the information is important and what you're doing as a either provider or as a practice to help the patient uh, prioritize and make decisions about what would really help and be beneficial to their health. Um, and then the last section is really about sustaining a health assessment. So once this thing's uh, up and running, how do you keep it going? Are there particular incentives this continues to align with? So you have a little bit of uh, revenue coming in from this. Uh, and importantly, is it still meeting your clinical priorities? Are the questions we're asking, are they hitting the mark? Are patients answering them in a way that we can do something with the information usefully? And are we able to give the feedback and follow up we need on these questions, or do we need to change something? And um, we heard from practices, and one practice said, you know, it's, it's best to get patient input directly. And so 
uh, they learned from patient surveys and one practice said, you know, really should just have a patient focus group around this. We learn a lot of information from convening our patients around a particular question that we have in our practice. So different ways to do that, but again, it's just about evaluating as you go, is this still, is this health assessment still meeting a need for us uh, in our clinic and are we able to uh, implement it as effectively as we had hoped. Um, I just want to point to the last bit here is the appendices. Uh, throughout the guide there are links to um, resources in the appendices which in this example includes a, a sample script for the annual wellness visit, uh, but there are a lot more resources in there um, with directions or links to um, websites for more detailed information around uh, coding, more particular health assessments for specific populations, and um, even some tools that you can use directly with patients. And we also, in response to what we heard from practices, provide at least a, a starter set of health assessment questions that um, have evidence in, of being suitable for uh, primary care practices. And here's a good link for um, ARC's Health Information Technology website, which has some great um, workflow tools for, um, in this case, information technology, but all the, the same tools apply for implementing health assessments too, so that, that's a great resource. Um, just a few takeaways, and before I open it up for questions, patients basically what we want. They want to have an informed conversation. Health assessments can help do that. Patients also want to um, talk with their providers about health assessments, and they're certainly expecting it. Teamwork works, and do this in small steps, and then organize the effort around a practice priority, and it's more likely to be a successful, longer-term, sustainable implementation of a health assessment. Um, I'll just open up to questions now. Thanks, Doug. Uh, great presentation, and uh, I look forward to uh, having you address some of these questions. We have uh, quite a few of them, so I will just uh, start from the top here. Um, uh, first question is, how well do the health assessments fit into discrete data in electronic health records? Can the data be used in uh, also, the second part of this is, can the data acquired from health assessments be used in population management as well as uh, with the respect to the individual patient? Uh, great question, and a lot depends on the electronic health record you have and the availability of these questions being in your electronic health record already or the ability to add them. And um, our experience was that some uh, EHRs are better at this than others, and some of it also depends on the sophistication of the uh, data extraction tools you have for your EHR uh, to be able to both enter the data into discrete fields and then extract it in, in a usable, uh, efficient, timely way so you can actually have a conversation with the patient either at the time of the visit or at some later point. Um, but we did see examples of this. In fact, one practice we went to had a uh, was using a uh, an electronic check-in tool where they had a tablet that had a health assessment that fed directly into their EHR and then later prompted the physician around areas of concern that they might want to talk with um, the patient about when they met them in the exam room. So yes, that can happen in real time. Um, and then also that same practice was using the information they collected from the uh, tablet health assessment for a later report to their care manager for the patients with diabetes for specific things they could follow up on with the patient um, if they were having trouble uh, managing their diabetes. And it might be that um, having a conversation with a patient about working with um, them on improving their diet or physical activity or uh, something like that. So yes, practice you can use these information electronically for both uh, an individual patient and a population or practice level need. Uh, we saw different capacity for that, but yeah, certainly can be done, but it, a lot depends on uh, the information systems you have. Thanks, Doug. The next question is about reimbursement. Um, uh, this particular person is saying they, they have experience with submitting uh, requests for, uh, for payment to insurance companies and they're not getting reimbursed. And I, I guess I'll, I'll add to that, I guess what they're asking, did we 
see any of that or have you heard much of that uh, in preparing this guide? Uh, so I'm, I'm no expert on uh, the, the billing and coding and all that, but we did hear uh, some examples where there are a few codes that could be used uh, pretty effectively and reliably for reimbursement. This is outside of the uh, annual wellness visit for Medicare patients. Um, but there were not many, and, and again, I, I don't know what the, the rules are around billing and coding, but um, mostly they're in, they seem to be in the, the preventive care um, uh, set of codes around identifying a particular uh, specific uh, health risk, such as um, one example we, we came across regularly was um, uh, risky sexual behavior. Okay, thanks, Doug. And as you said, the, the Medicare visit is fully reimbursable, but uh, some of the private insurers may not have signed on to that or are not uh, signing on fully to that. So some of the codes that are mentioned in the guide could be helpful in, in trying to get some reimbursement or to maintain reimbursement. Um, the next question deals with a uh, similar part is, are the health assessments integrated into a specific part of the electronic health record? Some of this which you addressed, are, are, and are there applicable uh, ICD, ICD codes or others that can in, be, be input based on the findings to help establish registries and retrieve data for uh, not only for, uh, for quality improvement initiatives? Uh, so there are a, a couple of questions in there, and again, I, I, yeah. I, I'm no expert on the billing and coding, but um, there are, so if, if you're thinking about uh, meaningful use uh, criteria for establishing meaningful use and demonstrating meaningful use of an electronic health record, um, then some of the questions that are required of that, for, for example, documenting that you ask and advise about tobacco use, um, those align quite well with um, health assessments in general, but I really can't speak to other uh, codes that, or ICD-9 codes that, um, and how they align with specific um, health assessment questions. Um, I will say though that um, the um, American College of Physicians for Internal Medicine, the AAP for Family Physicians, and the AC for um, pediatrics or, uh, include on their websites, they have very detailed um, billing and coding um, uh, pocket guides and more detailed guides for their membership who want to look at this a little more carefully. And they're, and they're very descriptive about the types of um, codes you can use for particular clinical activities. Thanks, Doug. Next question is how have health assessments or how could health assessments be used with behavioral health, such as the PHQ-9 tool for screening for depression? Uh, and um, can this be health assessments be seen as a success or a barrier for implementing depression screening? Uh, that's a great question. And uh, again, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll share an experience we had in one of the practices we visited. Uh, they actually agonized quite a bit over whether they wanted to do uh, a PHQ-9, or I'm sorry, a PHQ-2 at every visit uh, for their patients. They thought they would be overwhelmed with a um, number of positive PHQ-2s that would then have to be uh, required the full PHQ-9. Um, they decided to do it because it was the right thing to do for their patients, and it turned out that, that what they uh, landed on was a very good system was to do the first screening questions with the PHQ-2 for depression, and then of those that required follow-up, then immediately do the PHQ-9 and end up working very well and not being burdensome in large part because this was something their medical assistants could do. Um, and so the provider really didn't have to do anything and only had to act when they saw this PHQ-9 appear in their, uh, in their uh, electronic health record uh, for that patient when they met them in the exam room. And over and over we saw pretty much every practice we went to is using a PHQ-2 as the initial screener for depression. Uh, it's widely accepted and it's, it's often needed for um, some of the recognition programs anyway. OK, 
Okay, thanks, Doug. Next question is uh, a, another good question. In, in your experience, is it important to have someone clinical to implement the health assessment, or can patients do the health assessment on their own, or do you need someone to walk them through each question? Uh, so most of the practices we visited, patients do it on, on their own, and no problems with that. And, and the way it typically goes is the patient will complete it on their own, his or her own, and then uh, a staff member will review that. And if there's missing information, the staff member will just ask them directly to uh, fill in the information. Uh, most of the time, patients were very good about completing all the information. They're used to it and didn't have any problems. Um, there were some practices that talked about there's always a set of patients where we just need to do this one-on-one -on -one and help them uh, answer the questions. And they just didn't encounter much resistance to that. So both methods work. Uh, we did observe for some specific sets of questions, um, there was a preference from some of the clinicians to ask the questions directly because they felt like they could get a better answer. But for the most part, uh, these are questions that patients can answer on their own, either at the time of visit or outside the visit, and then uh, bring in the questions or have them um, sent directly to uh, the electronic medical record. Both work well, or all work well. Thanks, Doug. The, the next question, uh, you may have touched on most of this, but I'll, I'll bring it back up and see if you have anything to add. From a logistical perspective, how was the health assessment completed? For example, how was it, was it sent to the patient? Was it completed prior to their visit? And was it sent to the provider before their visit? Um, I'll, I'll share a couple of examples. The two practices that were using the guide to implement the full annual wellness visit assessment, they sent them to their patients first before the visit with a, a clear message that we want you to fill this out and bring it to the visit you have with our providers. So I think they, one practice reported about 80% of the patients did actually complete the full um, health assessment before their visit. Um, and then in terms of the handoff to, of that information to the provider, again, that varies uh, entirely by preferences for what's going to work with the practice flow and what providers want to see and how they want to have an interaction or conversation with patients. But uh, we saw all kinds of things that work, including uh, handing the health assessment directly to the provider who reviews it right there and gives immediate feedback to the patients uh, versus um, the provider just scanning quickly for things of concern or even having a, a medical assistant kind of pre view the health assessment and flag for the provider things that were concerning. So all kinds of methods, but it really depends on uh, staff capacity, workflow, training, and clinical preferences. Thanks, Doug. We have a comment from uh, Lynn Gilbert, a com uh, colleague of mine, who uh, says that uh, uh, she wanted to bring up uh, a focused bilingual health assessment called Heart Smart Kids for evaluating cardiovascular uh, risks, including overweight and obesity in pediatric primary care and community surveillance. She provided uh, the link, but it's www.heartsmartkids.com, and we'll send that out to everyone. Uh, uh, thanks, Lynn. Uh, we, there are, there's also additional information on adolescents that uh, the University of Colorado has prepared uh, in another time not too long ago that we include in this uh, health assessment guide. So um, always helpful to get additional methods on, on, on kids. Um, yeah, and actually then there's, a, there's, a, there's a really good question. I, I'm not sure we've touched on this, but uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, a question around patient privacy. Uh, and, and, and how the question should be asked and how do we maintain patient privacy uh, in, around the health assessments? Um, so, of course, you have to comply with all the HIPAA regulations around privacy, but I will share with you what both um, patients and community members in our advisory groups told us is, you know, they really expect that when they fill this out, anybody in a practice is going to see this, 
and they were not overly concerned with privacy about the information contained on the health assessments, even on the more sensitive questions. And their feeling was, if the question is so sensitive I don't want to answer it, then I'm not going to answer it. And so I don't think there was uh, much concern on the part of patients to, um, you know, do anything extraordinary about uh, privacy. I think that's a really good question, too, because as we did our review of the literature, we realized that many of the orange, orange, orig, originations of the health risk appraisal comes from occupational health, and there's, there's some individuals who still uh, are thinking, oh, is my job going to get this information, or who's going to get this information? But as Doug said, it's, it needs to be clear to the patients that this is a health-related uh, health assessment through the and it's HIPAA compliant and all that so that the information will not be getting back uh, to uh, their uh, their employers which is yeah. you know something that in the earlier stages of the health risk appraisal was uh, was out there yeah uh, thank you and for that uh, reminder uh, Rick the patients were clear about this point that they were concerned about their um, health plans getting this information. So they, they really expected this was uh, confined to people in the practice seeing this information and not going outside the practice. And that, you know, that underscore that when you're dealing with adolescents and who's getting the information and who's going to have eyes on it. So I think the privacy issue is a good one and something that needs to be considered across the, you know, the, the practices and how you can best handle that. There's a question um, on how has health assessment translated into better patient outcomes or uh, in terms of looking at metrics, how can we define outcomes? Um, I don't yeah, know if you so want to tackle that one, Doug, or? Sure. Um, with it, so I'll I'll start by saying, again, that the science here is incomplete on comprehensive health assessments, and if you took a global picture of, you know, how do things change over time on a, on a comprehensive health assessment, um, those data aren't complete, but we do know from um, occupational health that um, doing health assessments routinely can improve health outcomes on a, a num number of different metrics, um, common ones around blood pressure, uh, lipid levels, uh, physical activity and diet, if you want to consider that an uh, intermediate outcome. Um, but we also know from specific questions on a health assessment that when they're addressed uh, in alignment with the evidence that you can improve the outcomes. And just uh, as an example would be uh, depression screening. I mean, the whole um, recommendation from the Preventive Services Task Force is that the screening actually works if you can do the screening and appropriate follow-up you will get a benefit and you will see improved outcomes uh, on a depression metric. Um, I will say that the um, many of the metrics that we've included in the guide are sensitive to change over time and could be used to uh, monitor things like uh, quality of life or uh, improvements in physical activity or nutrition. Thanks, Doug. Uh, someone mentioned this, I think it's kind of a comment or maybe a question. Uh, about integration uh, of health information into tablets or some form of uh, new electronic media when uh, patients complete their registration for their appointment or make their appointment as a potential. Have you, have you, have you encountered that or seen that? Yes, and it can work, and there are a few um, applications out there, two if I can think of the top of my head. Um, I'm not going to <laughs> give the commercial names of them out, but um, they do work on a tablet uh, platform or a kiosk platform at patient check-in. The patient completes a health assessment and then it feeds directly into an electronic health record and then the electronic health record does whatever it needs to with the data or some other third-party um, data extraction tool. Uh, the one system we observed, the tablet was actually a real-time uh, look at patients as they were answering questions and so you could see how far along in the questionnaire patients were so you kind of had an idea how soon they were going to be done. It was a really neat system so yes it can be done and then those data can be used um, uh, immediately at the time of visit or on the back end for more practice level 
um, uh, work. Thanks, Doug. There's a comment uh, from someone mentioning that there's uh, a tool called ePro, Electronic Patient Reported Outcomes, that has been endorsed by the FDA and is used in clinical research. So I, I guess it's one of the many tools that are out there when, when conducting clinical trials that conducts information uh, from patient reported. And he's saying that that's uh, particularly uh, maybe a useful tool that can be brought into clinical practice to engage patients uh, in, in completing health assessments. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Doug, or not. Yeah, uh, thank you. And, and that just triggered in my brain something about there is, uh, there is movement afoot to uh, consolidate these health assessment questions into kind of a, a bounded set of more common uh, questions so that we're um, getting a bit more alignment so that patients aren't asked, being asked the same question 10 different ways. Um, and so there, there's some consolidation of these questions, which I think patients will appreciate, uh, but it also uh, gives us the ability to uh, use the same question across a lot of different settings for um, answering bigger questions about population health, for example. Thanks, Doug. The, the next person had a comment and a question. He states that, he or she states that it's time consuming to do a mini mental exam at the time of an annual wellness visit. Uh, in the health guide, uh, do we provide anything that evaluates cognitive function that could be used during an annual wellness visit? Um, I believe there is a, I'm not sure if it ended up in this guide, there might be one question around that, but I, I think there's a I, I think there's a couple of questions that are are in the guide that are circle around uh, looking at um, uh, uh, evaluating uh, mental status and uh, uh, and we do give I think links, but I believe there's two or three questions, Doug, in the guide. Yeah. And, have, and just to um, be clear on this point that the the annual wellness visit is designed to only talk about the health risk assessment with the patient. And we heard from more than one practice, if you try to do more than that, it's very difficult to do and you might not get reimbursed for it or the patient might have to pay an extra copay. So just a word of caution there. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. Um, here's a great question, a uh, practical one. How can aggregate data be easily obtained within an office setting when everyone is busy seeing patients? Uh, so, great question. And uh, again, the way we saw it in practices is it was somebody's job to um, get the training, have the tools, skills, and knowledge to, and uh, the technical tools and knowledge to do that behind the scenes. So it's not a not necessarily a provider's job to do that or a medical assistant's job, but um, it does take a, a realignment of priorities in a practice to say, okay, this is somebody's job and here's how we're going to carve out time for that person to do that because we think it's important for understanding something about our patient population. So it can be done, but it, again, it takes a little bit of realignment of priorities. Thanks, Doug. Here's an important question. Uh, can you uh, elaborate in the development of the guide on the sources for the individual questions, uh, are most of the questions part of an evidence-based validated scale of some sort? Um, so uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is we drew from a number of different sources, and including one source which was published by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that um, um, really took a closer look at the health assessment process specifically for the annual wellness visit and they compiled a set of questions um, and most of them have um, a history of use in uh, primary care settings in particular uh, but also have an evidence basis on their own and um, without getting into details uh, yes there is evidence or uh, a citable source for each of the questions in the, the guide we provide. Thanks, Doug. The next question is, do you know of any available health uh, assessments or health risk assessments a software available to, to uh, do this kind of work? Um, so again, there are a number of commercial 
um, assessment tools out there that are available and um, typically they had been um, available to uh, health plans and employers but they're also certainly available to primary care practices if you want to go that route um, and in some cases there are modules or questions built into an electronic health record um, but it can take um, some pretty detailed knowledge of where they are in the, the electronic record to extract them and make them usable. Okay, uh, we do have about maybe six or seven questions that we didn't get to. However, we will uh, um, uh, provide answers to those via email to the individuals that have asked it. At this point, I, I would like to uh, thank Doug and Kristen uh, for uh, the opportunity to provide you with this information for Doug and his team for all their, their great work. And I'll give Doug um, uh, a minute or, or uh, a minute or so to uh, close out if he has any party comments. Uh, no party comments. I'll just leave this on uh, the last slide here. And I'll, again, want to thank um, Dr. Ricciardi and all the folks at HRQ and NAPT Associates for pulling together this webinar. It's great. Love this opportunity to talk to everyone. And and here's the web address where you can get the how-to guide. It's available for download. And if even if you just go to the ARC um, homepage, uh, there's a, a scrolling slideshow there and the second option will take you directly to the guide and thank you very much and have a good day. Kristen, did you need to get back on? Yeah, we'll just show a couple final slides. Um, thank okay. you for that wonderful presentation um, and thanks to everyone for attending the webinar today. Um, we just wanted to let you know that this live activity, this webinar has been approved for 1.25 elective credits from the American Academy of Family Physicians. If you'd like to obtain CME credit for participating, please complete the online evaluation that you'll be prompted with at the end of the webinar. And then please email us at tbrn at abtassoc.com to request a copy of your CME certificate. Please stay in touch with us by joining the TBRN listserv. Listserv members receive a bi-weekly digest and other announcements of interest. And you can join the listserv just by sending us an email. Um, and finally, thank you again for attending. Please visit the TBRN website for more information on other webinars and events. And please feel free to email us at any time with suggestions for additional webinar topics. Thank you again, and this concludes today's webinar. Great job. Thank you. Great job. Don't forget to put that on your CV as an educational. The organ